All right, if you can give me a second, I'm letting more people in. Nice to see some students here of mine. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, I just wanna tell everyone how excited I am and lucky to have two of my biggest mentors here in the same room, be that a, a virtual room. Now, uh, every academic year I work or we work towards providing as many growth opportunities for our Southern California community here on the campus of La Sierra University. But for obvious reasons, we weren't able to provide workshops this year. But we are very lucky to have Professors H. Robert Reynolds and Richard Clare here virtually. Now, please help me welcome these two gentlemen with a warm virtual greeting. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, many of you saw the postings on Facebook. Many educators and students from across the U.S. have submitted several questions for our guests, and I'll do my best to get through them uh, as many as I can. The first question is related to teaching experience. And I'd like to ask these two gentlemen, maybe we'll start with Professor Reynolds, about their, not their college experience, because we know a lot about that already, but their teaching in the public school system. Professor Reynolds. Okay, uh, pleasure to be with you, by the way. Thank you. And uh, thank all of you for your interest in this. Anyway, my first job, was at a very small school in Southern Michigan, public school. And I taught all the instrumental music in ki kindergarten, not kindergarten, but elementary through high school. So I started beginners, I had a junior high group, I had a high school group. And the town that I taught in, the population, the total population of the town was 600. Most of the students that came into the school population from elementary through high school was 1,000. But most of those people were, were bussed in from farms in the area. So that's the way I started. And I also, in addition to teaching band and those, all those levels, I also coached basketball at the same time and played on the town basketball team. So my one recollection, the one thing that taught me the most in that area, well, two things. When we went to festival and I was... When we got our rating, I was mortified. We got a three. And the band was ecstatic. I couldn't imagine why. And I asked them, why, why do you feel so good about a three, for heaven's sakes? They said, because last year we got a five. So the thing that I learned a lot, learned the most in that area was I got a Christmas present from the band. And I opened the box and it was a bright red ski sweater. And there was a card in there. And the card said, here's a sweater to match your temper. <laughs> um, well, that got my attention because I didn't, I didn't want to be that way. But I mean, that's the way my college band director was. So I was like he was. But I, I wanted to change and not, not be that person. And I think that probably I did. My other uh, job, the next job I went to was at in California, Anaheim High School. At that point, Anaheim High School uh, was the only high school in Anaheim. Anaheim, I think, now has six high schools. At, la at last got maybe more, maybe less, I'm not sure. But, and there were a thousand students, it was a three-year high school, there were a thousand students in each grade. So a thousand 10th graders, a thousand 11th graders, a thousand seniors. So it was like starting all over again. Anyway, that's my public school background. Then I went to Cal State Long Beach in Wisconsin and finally at Michigan and USC. Professor Clary. Okay. Well, uh, my, my high school teaching experience was a five-year window of time. Um, Dr. Strange, my college band director, uh, let me know early on what he thought was going to happen to me and counseled me to, you know, move early and often. And my first move was to go to Maryvale High School in West Phoenix, which uh, having grown up in Tempe, I knew, I thought of it as another country at that point. 
Uh, and I think Maryville High School is known for really good football teams, uh, a suffocatingly uh, predominant uh, ROTC uh, class, and uh, lots of new babies and carriages at the first football game. Um, oh, and actual knife fights in the parking lot. So um, I took this job uh, with some trepidation, but I was just happy to get to work somewhere. And uh, I spent one year there. And uh, I guess the other thing Maryvale was uh, famous for was perpetual uh, third division ratings uh, for the bands and all kinds of endeavors. Uh, so I hitched my wagon to it. I found this kind of huddled mass of really nice kids that had been just hunkering down, waiting for something to happen. And I kind of went like the white tornado through the whole thing. And uh, it was really uh, quite a great experience. And happily, uh, I actually not only have had students from that first Maryvale band, one and done, uh, and most recently, the son of one of those kids who is a music educator now. And his father uh, actually went to Arizona State and played in the Sun Devil Marching Band, uh, like I did when I was uh, younger. And uh, he's a music educator now. Um, and his father apparently was president of the Sun Devil Band uh, when he was there. And he was uh, not a very distinguished <laughs> uh, trombone player, but he and his brother were brilliant kids and really enjoyed the the experience well <clears throat> i was called to go to marcos denisa high school which is where i did my student teaching the year prior at the same time that i was uh the single graduate assistant in the arizona state university band program uh so i did i actually did my student teaching simultaneously uh with being a, a teaching assistant in that first fall and uh, so it was a it was a lot of load, but it was a great experience. And uh, I went went back to the work at Marcus Denisa High School as I had done the year before, and spent four years there happily, uh, growing things, making things better. Uh, and then pretty soon the phone starts ringing about you know college jobs and stuff. And so the next thing I know then. I'm off to a one-year position at the University of Arizona that was supposed to turn into an opportunity to work on a DMA as they had, were going to search for Jim Keene's successor when he went to Illinois. Uh, they went through the search. I wasn't really crazy about how that all turned out. And so I decided to uh, take an offer to go to the University of Utah from Greg Hansen. And I spent four years there as assistant director of bands and uh, assorted other things, uh, trombone, euphonium teaching and all kinds of stuff. Um, so my next move was uh, from there after four years at Utah, I uh, went to the University of Washington and did doctoral study uh, with Tim Salzman and later Peter Erosh, who was the orchestra conductor there. and. Uh, my most recent formal mentor. And I learned a path of uh, knowing that was built in uh, the traditions that he was steeped in. He was the conducting teacher of Edo of Art at the Concerca Bau. And he was hilarious, hilariously funny about his impressions of Edo. Um, was one of my heroes because I would, had already purchased all of his recordings and wanted to, you know, wanted to be that when I grew up. Um, I left, <clears throat> I left there <clears throat> incredibly uh, to go be director of bands at the University of Kentucky. And I spent 10 very uh, whirlwind like years there, but uh, I got there with some really great faculty uh, they were a little bit under the radar, but the students wanted only to get better. They wanted to be a part of something that, that was great. 
And I think some of that is steeped into what is a pretty overblown, um, I guess, importance on marching band competitions. Uh, the state has grown and they're, they're more comprehensive now, but it used to be all about, um, all about who was gonna win their class at the marching band show. And uh, so <clears throat> when, I, when I went to Kentucky, uh, they asked me, I got a, a charge that was, I thought pretty hilarious given what had happened there before. Um, but they said, so we've got this great big marching contest and you know, we're, we're hoping that we can provide leadership to kind of move people's attention away from that. And I said, and I said, yeah, well, that sounds like a good idea. And said, well, what, what would be your plan? <laughs> and I said, I think we're gonna have to wait for an entire generation of people uh, to pass along and then continue to do good work and send our people out who are gonna be less inclined to just concentrate on that. And that all worked out before I knew it, I was off to Florida State University um, because I was compelled mostly by some alums, students of Jim Croft, who are prominent college band directors, um, who thought I would be a good fit and want, encouraged me to apply. And quite to my surprise, that's where I've been for you know, 17 years now or something like that. So there it is. Awesome. Thanks so much. So it seems like people really want to know a lot about you. So the next question is, what inspires you? Let's start with Clary this time. All right. <laughs> got, this is all a scrolling thing here. What inspires you? <laughs> I know I've got that question here. Ah. All right, I've got a list of things here. Um, courage, intelligence, creativity, artistic sensibility, achievement, and compassion. Uh, and that spreads all kinds of stuff. My, my wife will tell you, uh, bless her heart, that I, I cry like a baby when I'm moved by anything that's uh, an artistic impulse or an act of compassion or courage and... Uh, so I think I'm, I've always tried to be that kind of person. And uh, I stand ready to be inspired pretty much every moment. And that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Professor Reynolds, same question. Well, yeah, I'm gonna answer in a little different way. My first inspiration was my high school band director. Who was, we didn't have, when I was in high school, we didn't have all that great a high school band, but he was very good and a very good musician, a very good teacher. And he helped me a lot and challenged me. I was a horn player and, and for whatever reason, I could play pretty well. And I was sitting behind or, or next to uh, the euphonium player who was a good friend of mine. And, and while I was going on the French horn, oompa, 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 da, 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 he was singing these songs. -da 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 -da. And I went up to the band director and I said, you know, I, I, I think I want to transfer to, to euphonium, a baritone. And he said, I won't let you do that. <laughs> but what I will let you do is I will let you play some of those parts. And I'll give you the music, but the music's in bass clef and C. So I was ready to do anything to stop playing afterbeats. So I learned how to do that. And then he would ask on the on Fridays, he would say, Does anybody would anybody like to conduct a band who on, on pieces we've been rehearsing all week? Because we rehearsed five days a week. And I always did, and hardly anybody else did. And then he started helping me. If you did this instead of that, if you do this with your left hand you get them to play louder or softer and so on. So he helped me a great deal. And then the other person who really, really inspired me when I went to college, I took first semester conducting class 
with the greatest teacher I have ever had of anything. And that was Elizabeth Green. So if you don't know about Elizabeth Green, she's written several books, go and look them up. And she taught me the grammar of conducting, how to do this and how to do that, how to start this, how to cut people off, how to bring them in. How do you bring somebody in when they don't start on the beat? I mean, all kinds of stuff. That she, and she could do everything that she asked us to do. And we would do exercises. And uh, there's a whole bunch of side stories to that that, I, that we don't need to go into, but uh, I'm happy to do that. But uh, she was the inspiration. But the third one, I was asked to do the All Southern California High School Honor Band the very first honor band I ever did when I was at Long Beach State. And we would rehearse on Sunday afternoon and then play at the, at the, the CSBOA convention. And they hired Fred Fennell to be the guest conductor. And so it was, he was going to conduct half the concert. And I was going to conduct half the concert. And, so, and what really happened was I actually prepared his music more diligently than I prepared my own. Because my goal was and he was going to stand up on the podium and start rehearsing and say, everything is just the way I want it. There's, there's, there's nothing I can do because everything is, is just perfect. So what really happened is he got on the podium and took this concert-ready preparation that I had handed him and just took off musically. It just skyrocketed. And he didn't do everything the way Elizabeth Green did. If the music went up, he went up, even if it was on the downbeat. So he conducted the music as it's happened. So I learned all the techniques and the grammar, and I'm so glad I did from Elizabeth Green. And I learned what making music as a conductor was from Fennell. Those are my inspirations. Awesome. That's great. Um... So I know that Professor Reynolds and I talk about this a lot, but uh, the next question would be, uh, what music have you listened to lately that you find to be special and why? And we'll start with Reynolds this time, please. Okay, well, I, I, don't, I don't listen to band music. It's not that I don't like band music, I love band music. The problem is with me, I know too much about it. I've lived a long life and I've played a lot of pieces and so, in a piece, a band of winter ensemble music, I know when the piccolo, E flat clarinet, and oboe are going to play in unison soon. And I'm worried about are they going to make it? Are they going to be in tune? Are they going to? Oh, thank heavens. I don't want to think those thoughts. I want to, I want to hear the music making. So I go to things, my, my music listening is on things that I don't know nearly as much about. So I listen to Schubert and Beethoven piano trios. I listened to the singing of Jesse Norman, singing songs of Mahler. And so, because in that I'm only listening for, I'm only trying to be touched by the music that's being made, not by the technique of making that music. So. Professor Clary, same question. Um, well, yeah. So it, 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 this is a particularly interesting question under the circumstances we've been in. And, uh, you know, I've officially conducted one concert in the last year, uh, just completed in April under, you know, the conditions we've all been under. Uh, but even, even with that in place, uh, I also still, find myself not really listening to band music except to listen to new pieces uh, that are being created daily or it seems like by my email box uh, you know six or seven uh, composers are writing new pieces daily so that I'm, I'm trying to keep up with that but I, uh, I've also, as a musician, I, everyone thought in, that I went to college with thought I, I was going to um, just be a jazz trombone player and go to Los Angeles and, and you know, be famous or something. And uh, I started conducting and decided, even though I had actually, actually an opportunity to do that, incredibly, 
uh, I turned it down because I was bitten with the conducting bug. That being said, I'm still fired in the kiln of all of those musical disciplines that I participated in as a trombone player. And uh, I find myself still very interested from all kind of points of the of the uh, scene. And so, you know, just a couple of days ago, I got uh, a vinyl copy of Pat Metheny's newest uh, contribution, which I think, uh, I think the project is called uh, From This Place. It's his newest thing. It's, uh, it's got an orchestra. Um, it's just sheerly beautiful. And uh, talk about <laughs> what I'm inspired by. I'm inspired by that. Uh, just recently, and I, I, I'm a little bit of a kind of old technology fan because there's so much great music that was recorded by great artists during the LP and reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape era that uh, I've still got my Akai reel-to-reel -reel and I'm still feeding it with uh, interesting stuff. And just, I think last week on eBay, I got a hold of a perfect condition reel-to-reel -reel of uh, the Poulenc organ concerto and the uh, harpsichord concerto conducted by, I guess it's uh, Iona Brown, who I think I remember from the old days was a like a principal violinist or something with the Academy of St. Martin. And uh, I was stunned. First of all, I'm a very big Poulenc fan. And to hear how stunningly beautiful, even my wife from upstairs came down and went, what is that? And I was inspired to go back and to hear great playing and great conducting uh, from a time way before I would have been aware of who Poulenc was. And uh, so that, I find that to be an inspiration is what I'm interested in. Um, I guess the other big surprise is I ran across a still sealed reel-to-reel -reel recording of Bernstein's recording of Ferdy Grofet's uh, Grand Canyon Suite, which as a, <laughs> as a, a Grand Canyon State uh, person for most of my life, uh, I was very familiar with that piece. And as a you know, snobbish uh, wannabe uh, artiste, uh, was not particularly interested in its cultural importance or lack of importance at the time. But I put this thing on machine and played it. And I was struck with how effective the piece was because Bernstein took it seriously and made something that I think is on a, a magnitude higher than I had ever heard it conceived. Or maybe I'm just smarter now and it was always, you know, <laughs> and it was always being played that well. But either way, it's in the now and like this week. And uh, so I'm just trying to listen to all of the um, great stuff. I, I ran across this way, a reel-to-reel -reel of Zubin Mehta's uh, uh, Rite of Spring recording in New York, one that I probably didn't pay attention to because I was too drunk with Chicago Symphony at the time. Uh, although I've always been a Zubin fan because he was in LA. And uh, if you're in Arizona, the center of the universe is Los Angeles. It's not New York. And so he was a big hero of mine. And I was stunned at how fantastic that recording is. And also his Mahler 5 with the LA Philharmonic. And uh, so I, I, I actually have a little hair follicle standing up right now. I remember all of those experiences. And uh, I, as, I, as I can kind of see down uh, the path toward uh, the time that I'm going to turn over my position to someone else, uh, I know exactly how I'm going to spend that time. I'm going to be listening to all those thousands of recordings I collected and haven't gotten back to. And I think I'm going to be a happy person. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's talk music education here for a little bit, or maybe for a lot. Um, what should be the most important job of a music educator? And we, was this, is it Clary's turn or Reynolds? I forget now. Let's start with uh, Professor Reynolds. 
I don't know if there's one so you know individual important thing or several, but if I were nailed down to just naming one, it would be that the students that I would have would love music for the rest of their lives. It's not so much how well they played, although that's that's good and that's important. It's whether they really felt the music enough that they want to continue that feeling after they leave the band or playing their instrument or whatever happens next. So that has to be the guiding thing. And I think we're in a, a difficult stage and have been for a while in building the band. I want to build the best band I can and the band is going to win. I think that's, that's a very short term goal. And so anyway, I could go on, but that, I, I don't want to diminish that one thought. Oh, that's, that's, those, those are great, Bob. Um, I, you know, this is kind of a big, big question, but uh, I suppose fundamentally it's just as, as uh, my friend Maestro Bob has just said, we hope that what we're going to do is implant some sort of enough understanding and appreciation for the process of participating in a musical ensemble. Uh, and aspiring to do something that is beyond what you would expect to accomplish. And uh, I think that, I think anything short of that is probably going to be a pretty mechanical operation. And I think too much of that really uh, happens. We make objective sorts of uh, guideposts and uh, outcomes that can be justified all kinds of ways from all kinds of different directions and, and everything. But at the end of the day, um, I think it's whether, whether they ever touch their instruments again or not, uh, hopefully when they hear something, they'll be able to relate to a successful experience and they'll have better accessibility to appreciate it later in their life. And if it goes really, really well, then like, like the young trombone player that was in my Maryvale band, whose son is a trombone playing band director, uh, then, you know, there's a generational kind of effect that it trickles down from that. And so I, I, the, it's the biggest job in the world, as near as I can tell. Being a teacher of anything, I think, is a ridiculous, huge job. But if you're a music teacher, that comes with all kinds of extra stuff uh, that's in the fine print or isn't, where you've got a, you're going to have to basically invent a way to fly around the room under your own power uh, and get the students to do likewise somehow. Um, I, I love to tell my, my students about uh, when I was a high school band director, I took a very intelligent uh, young horn player who was in the flag corps my, my first fall. And uh, she said that she wanted to play an instrument. She was excited about that. So she said she wanted to play horn. So she was in my quote intermediate band, which was 12 kids uh, that I, I were, was afraid to hurt if they were in the marching band. And uh, I gave private lessons five days a week to those guys wandering around the room. And you know what? Um, <laughs> this was, I guess this was about halfway through. And uh, she, she literally learned the third horn part uh, to Lincolnshire Posey um, and played it pretty well when it was over. And uh, I hear from her too. Um, and assorted other doctors and lawyers and, uh, mothers of 12 and all kinds of people who, who have been in there. And, and I think, I think it's the inspiration that actually matters in, in the end. Uh, Cause my experience is that uh, I still have high school kids that I taught who stay in touch and send cards and letters and all kinds of very nice things. And it's clear to them that 
what they did one <laughs> one and another together was so important to them that it actually had a positive uh, thrust for their the rest of their life and they if they're not if they didn't go on playing their instrument most of them are pretty uh pretty dyed in the wool hardcore band parents now so that's a good thing too awesome uh speaking of inspiration one of my favorite things to do is to to attend rehearsals and i'm very lucky here that i'm pretty close to the la phil and i get to see some of their rehearsals or used to <laughs> um now uh what have you learned from other conductors and, uh, and teachers from rehearsals or your own personal teachers, transformational moments, et cetera? And we'll start with uh, Professor Clary, please. Wow. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've been watching rehearsals what feels like my whole life. And uh, I'm still pretty addicted to that. And I counsel my students to take advantage of the embarrassment of riches of resources on YouTube now. Um, <laughs> when I think about how narrow the input hose for finding out how to, how to do all this uh, was when I was growing up, and I sure, I'm sure that Bob uh, will say the same thing. I mean, the whole idea that you can just go to YouTube and do a search and then <laughs> just about everything that's ever been played has been filmed and someone's conducting it or they're rehearsing it. And uh, I, I think that's just astonishing. And there's no, I, I, I kind of go, geez, <laughs> you have any idea how much money I spent collecting all of those recordings, taking mental health days when I was a high school band director and as a college band director, just to go to a record store and check everything in there that might be relevant or something that I felt like I should know. So I, you know, I, I learn every time I watch anybody conduct or play because that's the mode I'm in. I want to, I want to perceive, test myself. What are, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? How effective is it? Um, how, how would you go about solving some of the same problems? Uh, and so uh, this has been just a regular thing. That's why I've got VH, VHS tapes of uh, Paul Hindemith conducting the uh, Chicago Symphony, uh, which I learned a lot from. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Talk about a guy who was a, a Swiss army knife of uh, conducting. He, he, he was almost doing nothing, but if you get a hold of that, of that video, and it must be on YouTube by now, uh, of him conducting the Chicago Symphony on his uh, Opus 50 uh, brass and strings piece, man, he's, he's large and in charge. And uh, it was, I, I love to show that to my students because, you know, and, and I think Hindemith's getting boxed around a little bit right now uh, for reasons I don't really understand. But, uh, you know, to my, to my estimation, he was one of the most important musicians of the 20th century. And uh, so <laughs> I think, I think that, uh, I encourage all of my students, regardless whether they're conductors or not, to observe conducting in all kinds of environments so they can learn more about it. I think the best people in the best symphony orchestras are curious about conducting or they are conductors. Uh, and more of that's going on now than, than ever, I think. Uh, uh, one of the greatest clarinet players in the world is carving himself another career as a conductor and uh this is happening pretty much all over the planet so i think anybody who's in, interested in that should be interested in, in study and incidentally he is studying with someone and showing up looking like a fashion model and you know all the stuff awesome. i can't wait to hear what bob says yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it starts with, it's the same, it's a variation of what Rick was saying. But it's, for me, it started when I was just newly at Long Beach State. I went to Long Beach State in my late 20s 
So I wasn't 30 years old yet. I was the number two band conductor there. And as it happens, there was a saxophone player there who was quite good, who was doing graduate work and wasn't very much younger than I was. So he and I would have conversations in the hallway and after always in restaurants and all kinds of stuff. And he and I hung out together and got along really well. And one time he said to me, and I fortunately I took it right. He said, you should take conducting lessons. <laughs> now, this was a student telling a faculty member that he should take conducting lessons. But fortunately, I took it right because I knew his intentions. I said, well, who would I take from? He said, well, Zubin Mehta is the music director of the LA Philharmonic. Take from him. <laughs> so I've told this story a lot, so many of you have probably heard it. But um, I wrote to Zubin Mehta because this was before emails or texts or anything like that. And I said, I want to take conducting lessons. Well, I got a letter back from a third level assistant to the assistant's assistant saying, Mr. Mater does not give conducting lessons. So not to be deterred. And that's been, a, that's been a hallmark of my life, not to be deterred. I said, well, can I come to a rehearsal? OK, you can come to a rehearsal. Well, then can I come to another rehearsal? OK, you can come to another rehearsal. And finally, they got tired of me asking all this. They said, okay, we'll let you come to any rehearsal as long as you tell us ahead of time because some conductor may not want to have anybody there. So I went to Zoo and made his rehearsals and learned an enormous amount. I, in fact, studied conducting with Zubin Mehta, except that Zubin Mehta doesn't know it. <laughs> only, I, only I know it. And I made a list for another project I'm doing of conductors that I have witnessed rehearsing, because that's where the action is. Concert conducting is really good, but rehearsing is really good. Okay, these are people that I, and they're in alphabetical order, not in priority order. So Marion Alsop, uh, I'm just gonna give you the last names. Bloomstead, Boulez, Chayi, Dudamel, Fiedler. I actually played in an orchestra conducted by Fiedler, so I, I really watched him with his. Um, Gergio, Giulini, Guerrero, Malki, who I think is probably the finest female conductor on the planet. Uh, Meta, Andres Nelsons, Ormandy, Rattle, Solonen, Schuler, Robert Shaw, Slatkin, Van Dachnani, and Zinna. And fortunately, my mother was a music lover and she thought I might like to go to a concert in Cleveland. So we drove, I, I grew up in Northwestern Pennsylvania. So Cleveland was less than a hundred miles away. So we drove to Cleveland and watched the NBC Symphony give a concert with Toscanini conducting. So I saw Toscanini kind of, I didn't see him rehearse, but I saw him conduct. And so what I've learned from all these people is, is much more than the technique of conducting. That's the least of it. Because the technique is not what, what the real serious orchestral musicians want to have. They want to have a vision of the piece. I'm involved in a project now. I'm learning a lot also. I'm trying to find out the difference between a good conductor and a great conductor. So I have um, stopped me. Geo, if I go on too long about this. No, please, please do. <laughs> um, it turns out that I know a lot of really good musicians, better than good. And the thing about this project was I decided early on I wasn't going to ask any conductors what their thoughts were about the difference between a good and great conductor. <clears throat> I was only going to ask high level professional musicians playing in major symphony orchestras. So I've got a number of people playing in the Boston Symphony, the LA Philharmonic, Pittsburgh Symphony, Philadelphia Orchestra, Houston Symphony, New York Philharmonic. And all, these are people I've known and are friends of mine. And they were, they were generous enough to write me emails about their thoughts. And now I'm in the process of kind of putting all that together because there's some interesting things. But one of the things that not everybody, but nearly everybody said, was the conducting technique was not all that important. 
but then the orchestra can already play. I think it's much more important for the junior high school band. It's not important at all for elementary band. I mean, you can walk around the room, as Rick said, giving private lessons to everybody during the rehearsal. But anyway, that's, that one statement by that one person who's still a good friend of mine, Leo Potts, the saxophone player, has made an enormous difference because I will not be deterred. If I want to go to rehearsal, I'll go to rehearsal. I started, at, after I finished Michigan, I started um, conducting at USC for a number of years. And I became acquainted with the personnel director of the LA Philharmonic who would get me in to all of all the rehearsals. So I saw a bunch of those people come up and up in rehearsing the LA Philharmonic. And I had my own kind of special seat. It wasn't in the audience, it was sort of semi behind the orchestra, so I could see what the conductor was doing. That's where I learned that those are the major things I learned and how I learned it. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, Professor Clary, let's talk about uh, programming a little bit here. So um, during a concert cycle, what do you consider or prioritize when programming music for various different ensembles? Huh. Well, um, I think this is um, another one of the secret sauces. I think uh, it's what everybody wants to know. And uh, unfortunately, in my experience, uh, it's a little bit in the ether and not so, so, so very capturable and, uh, and adaptable from person to person. Um, I think fundamentally what we're always told is that we want to select from the best music that we can find that's going to be suitable for the group that we're talking about. Uh, which sounds great uh, until you put younger people in a room and start asking them, so how do you tell if the piece is, is really great? And they look at you like, um, and that can be a short conversation. So, you know, it, for me, I, I tell my students that their, their safest bet is to, keep a hold of those pieces that they remember uh, enjoying and learning from when they were in school. Hopefully, uh, and I encourage them to keep, in hindsight, unfortunately, by the time they get to me now, uh, but Dr. Strange always told us that we should be keeping all of those programs that we played in. Because he said when his biggest his biggest disappointment was not saving those programs because his first job was in a, like a two room schoolhouse in Kansas. And he could not remember the names or the faces of any of those kids that he taught in that first job. And it, it haunted him the whole rest of his career. And so he always told his, the people in his groups, please remember, to save the programs. If, if, if you don't want to keep them in your room, send them to your parents, but put them someplace so that you, you'll be able to get to them. And so I took that pretty seriously. And my mother, uh, unfortunately, wasn't good at throwing anything away. So I had a bunch of those that are in a box someplace still. Um, so that's one thing to start with. See what pieces that had an impression on you that might be suitable for the group that you're programming for. Uh, I've heard many, many uh, teachers and mentors say, you know, start out teaching the music you love, getting as close to that as you can, because that's what you're going to teach with passion and with a, a certain amount of enthusiasm and purpose. Uh, I think that people who are completely uh, enamored of doing whatever happens to be brand new, and thank God, nowadays, um, we have all kinds of composers who we have good access to who are writing all this music, and it's fantastic. It's never, it's never been more interesting uh, or easier um, to seek out new 
interesting repertoire. But I think you got to start somewhere. And uh, you have to remember those things in your own musical development that made an impression of you. Maybe, maybe you played a Persichetti piece in high school or something like that. And maybe it wasn't the symphony. And, you know, so maybe you ought to hunt around for another opportunity to teach a, a less complicated Persichetti piece to, the, to that group that might be able to cover that. And then our mandate for all of us is to go out and learn more and learn how to evaluate, you know? And I think a lot of people miss their opportunity and maybe it's because I was, uh, you know, sitting in the first trombone chair all the time uh, with not so much to do sometimes. And I was stretching my ears out to try to figure out which one of those third clarinet players was playing sharp. Uh, I was kind of making myself busy in that way. Um, so I, I, I'll bet I've heard it in the course of my life, uh, Bob talk about, <laughs> you got to pick the best music that you have access to. And you got to, you got to make sure that it's a good fit And here's where more secret sauce is involved. And this is hard. I somehow, and I must've gotten this from Dr. Strange too, is that he, he said, you need to find a piece that your group might possibly get to like right here, not there maybe, but right here. And what I found out is that that takes a lot of uh, premonition and trust in yourself and in your students to go about doing that. But somehow I managed to do that pretty well and still do. Um, so I have, I think I've sacrificed what sacrificed in some cases, what probably were less than technically perfect or stunning performances in my career. Um, but we, the misses are pretty narrow actually. Um, and then how all that happens just has to do with what was going on in rehearsal and what kind of communication level there was and the level of trust that was in the room. Um, I've learned that student musicians today aren't much different than I was when I was their age. They really aren't, except they're smarter and they have access to more information and they're the better, you know, they're better they're better prepared musicians in lots of ways. Wonderful. Professor Reynolds, same question. Well, as Rick mentioned, choosing music is a big deal. I mean, a huge deal. And I know when I started out, because like, like Rick, I played in a really good college band. And so the music that we were playing when I was a student was completely inappropriate because my little band that got a five before I got there <laughs> couldn't play any of that stuff. And so I didn't know really what it was. So I got a hold of the state music, so music list, the graded list for, for the state in the state of Michigan at that point. And I went down the list until I could find a piece or two that I knew and there were like 25 pieces in each category, 25 grade ones, 25 grade twos, 25 grade fives and sixes and so forth. So when I found our area in, in grade three, I found a piece in there. I think we could play that piece. Then that let me know there were 24 other pieces about that same difficulty level. And you can do that now around the country. You can, if you got a pencil, write this down, UIL. U-I-L, <laughs> Texas Music List. And it, and it lists hundreds of thousands of pieces in, in grade categories. And it's available not just for music educators in Texas, it's available for everybody. But I would start with your own state because they must have music lists in your own state. And that, that will give you a start. It's not the end. I wouldn't use that as the end point, but that's a start in selecting the music. But my, my other item on, on what music to select is you have to select, as Rick was mentioned, some piece 
that's going to challenge them. And I, for my own personal thought, I think that's one piece, not seven. You've got seven pieces on your concert. One of those pieces should, should they should be really stretching in order to make it even halfway recognizable. All the other music, they should play easily, easily. Because with that, then you can work on the music. You don't have to be working on the technique all the time. So. That's what I have to say about selecting music. Awesome. Uh, I guess a bit of a quirky question here. Let's see. Uh, um, what is a question you wish someone would ask you in these things, but never does? And what would your answer be? Good luck with that question. Let's go with Professor Clary first, maybe. <laughs> Somehow I thought that was going to fuck me. <laughs> uh, I have no allusions to that. I guess... And I, I guess it's as simple as this. Uh, I'm not sitting here waiting for somebody to ask me a particular question. Um, I'm not that person. <laughs> I really am not. I come to an experience like this and I field questions and relate my own personal experience and my own perceptions and, and whatnot. Uh, in a way that I hope will be helpful. Um, but the whole idea that somehow I've got a strong box full of three, you know, <laughs> three ways to order the universe with, with no, with no of the sweat and, and uh, tears. I, I, I don't, I don't think I have that. And I don't, so I don't really know how to respond to that. Uh, I remain ready to hear whatever question comes, but I certainly am not hoarding one. Ooh, I hope somebody asked me this one because I think most of us in a position to be, uh, to have the honor of taking people's attention like all of you guys. Um, I think that uh, that's pretty disappointing. I can't, I can't imagine that that's, uh, that's really what, uh, what you want to know. What I, what I do like are, are questions that uh, I have to ponder and think about uh, before I give an answer. It just doesn't automatically kind of pop out all by itself. Well, Professor Reynolds, <laughs> what, you have so any... I guess I, I, I sort of just kind of kind of slap the hockey puck out of the goal there. Yeah, well, I agree with everything Rick says. Perfect. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. Yeah, there are, I always wish that people would ask me more musical questions. Mm. Not any specific question, but more questions about music. How do you create, and the questions keep coming about the performance structure. How, how does somebody play this? How do you get somebody to play in rhythm? How do you, you know, I once had a, there was a question earlier, I don't know whether you're gonna ask this, I may be jump-starting this question, Gio, I don't mean to, but uh, we did a concert, I took a tour with the Michigan band throughout the state of Michigan and ended up at Interlochen with our final concert. And they have a nice concert hall there. And at the end of the concert, a lot of people knew everybody. And so we were gathering on stage, everybody was talking. Some high school band director came up to me with all the people around and said, I've never heard a band play that well in tune. How do you do it? And I said to him, I have no idea. <laughs> and the principal clarinet player, who's now the clarinet teacher at Oberlin, said, I know how it's done. Everything we do in rehearsal has to do with listening. So, and that's, that's because of the music. So I, I always want more questions about music than about the techniques of making things better. Perfect. All right, so we're running out of time here, but I do have a final question. And actually several people asked this in the questionnaire. They want a recommendations from both of you for personal musical growth. Personal musical what? Growth. How to become a better musician, conductor, et cetera, anything that you have for them. 
And we'll start with Professor Reynolds. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I would do something for yourself at least once a year. And there are a lot of conducting workshops around the country. I would go to one of those. And very often, you, you on a conducting workshop, you get two for the price of one. There's the host teacher conductor, and then I usually have a guest person with them. So you might get Rick Clary and Mallory Thompson at, for in one session. I mean, how great would that be? And so I would definitely try to outline something every year to grow on. And then you've got, I would, I would, I would read. I mean, not just music, I'd read a lot of other things, but music, I've got a, there was one question earlier about books for young conductors. So I, I have one book, but I also, look, I'll tell you something about the, the book. I have is called Teaching Techniques and Insights for Instrumental Music Educators. The, the word, the, the name you need to know is the author, Joe Casey, C-A-S-E-Y. And it's published by GIA Publishing Company. Which, and GIA publishes, as you probably all know, a whole lot of stuff from, from music teachers and band directors. But what this one book has in common that I like so much is that Joe Casey interviewed a whole lot of people and asked them a, a number of questions. So you could, if you've got a thing, <clears throat> there was a question somebody asked earlier, <clears throat> at least on paper by a geo, how do I get my band to play better in tune? There's a whole section on intonation. And then you get Fennell and, and Rick Clary and me and Arnold Gabriel and, the, and Larry Ratcliffe and a whole ton of people talking about that one issue. Or you can go into the book and say, I want to find out everything that Larry Ratcliffe has to say. And it will list all the things on all the subjects. Or I want to find out what Frederick Fennell has to say and everything he does. Or you can go in topic by topic. So it's a book not to be read from the beginning to the end but to be investigated as you go. And I'm gonna cause you more work, Gio, I'm sorry about this, but I'm gonna send you a list of books that I recommend. Wonderful. And by the yeah. way, Lonnie just posted the book that you were talking about. If you wanna go on the chat, thank you, Lonnie. Um, there's a link to the book. Yeah, it's like 50 bucks. It's not cheap, but it's a big book, hardbound copy. <clears throat> But I, I will, I will uh, Gio, I'll email this, this to you. And if other people would want it, they can get in touch with you and you can email it to it. No, I have everybody's emails. I can, I can send it to everyone. Pretty okay. easy. Yeah, thank you. I'll definitely do that. All right. Well, not everybody may want it, but throw it out. <laughs> All right, Professor Clary. Okay. Um, one of our questions was, do you have any reading recommendations for young conductors? And I, I, some of these are adjacent to each other. And so I, I kind of, I put some thought into that one. And I think, I think that, that, that your growth in the profession is going to be parallel to your growth as a more and more fluent an interesting musician. And so I recommend reading, viewing, hearing everything you can about music, society, art, civics, you name it. Make yourself a smarter person. Be a passionate, passionate pursuer of great music. There's so much out there. I'm going to spend my entire retirement on YouTube. All the, all the while cursing under my breath at all the thousands and thousands of dollars that I put into cassettes and CDs and DVDs and whatnot that apparently are eventually going to be all on the same website. Um, I, I think I, that's the story of my life is that I, I guess many of the friends that I grew up with used to say and still do um that that clary's listening to music like 24 
24 seven. And you know, uh, it's not so true now uh, as it was 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, um, but it's still pretty true. And at some point I thought that being the best musician I could be was going to involve being somebody who was interested in listening to lots and lots of music and making, uh, making some sort of a, a note about what kind of impressions I had on it. And so I, yeah, I think, I think that, uh, you know, there, there've been a, a couple of great conductors, uh, Bruno Walters one is to be a musician is to only be a musician or something like that. And, uh, you know, much of what you need to do is become a more curious, more helpful, um, more willing to lead human being. Cause the, you know, which pieces you choose and how you get them to, temper a, a dominant seventh chord uh, is really just the kind of stuff that you, you make sure and sweep up and make sure that that's tidy. But uh, I encourage you, if, if you're at all somebody who can listen to what you understand is supposed to be really, really great music that you're supposed to appreciate and be able to cherish for a long time, and you aren't feeling that, then you have a lot of work to do. You have a lot of work to do. And uh, I've, had, I've had a lot of people in this sort of thing, it hasn't been in virtual, but I, I, I did the, gosh, I guess it was the Tennessee uh, Governor School for the Arts or something and a bunch of band directors came and they had lots of questions about how do I get a personal life? And I laughed and I said, well, I know how I did it. Uh, I realized that I, I wasn't going to have uh, I wasn't going to have a motorcycle. I wasn't going to have a boat. I wasn't going to have I wasn't wasn't going to be uh, four wheeling. I I was not going to be bass fishing. I was not going to be doing that kind of stuff. And I realized if I'm going to if I'm going to do what I what it is that I say I want to do, then I'm going to have to be putting a whole lot of my time into making that better, and then all the rest of it on trying to take care of my family and to be available to them. And uh, so I, in, a, in a lot of ways, you know, you need to look at the big picture. Uh, this is a very, at least in my case, it's been a very rewarding, uh, exciting career and I'm still engaged. Even this year, which has been so horrible to deal with on every level. But I'm already, working on what's ahead. Um, and I, I encourage everybody uh, to search inside yourself and see whether you have it in you to be a more curious, more reactive, a more appreciative listener to art music. Because I think that's, that's one of the things that I've got going for me is that uh, Sir David Whitwell basically heard my first high school band, you know, at Maryvale. And uh, he, he left me a pretty withering, uh, what I thought was going to be a pretty withering critique tape that I listened to in my apartment on Sunday morning in my underwear and heard the thing go by. And he said, now the following comments are for the conductor and the conductor only. If there are students in the room, please turn off the machine now. And I went, uh oh, here it comes. Because Dave Whitwell had, it was very, very famous for pretty much laying it right down the middle. And he didn't care who, who else heard it. And uh, fortunately, what he said was inspiring. He encouraged me to go get Dover scores, learn the great music of the world. And as he said, then, you know, we did uh, Corral and Shaker dance of Zedeklik. He said, if you learn the great music, of the world and the music of the most important composers, then John Zedeklik will hold no mysteries for you. <laughs> and so I took him at his word and I, he recommended that I look into Dover scores. I got them, I bought recordings, had a, a yearly trip with the Rite of Spring score and my George Schulte CSO 
uh, recording. And uh, there was, I think it was every six months or something like that, I went through this and, and tried to conduct my way through it and stay in orientation. And there was this one day that I went all the way through it and I thought, I've done something. And that came in right, right handy before even I was going to do the Stravinsky Octet uh, or the Symphonies of Wind Instruments. Um, but I hope that I hope that all of you will be blessed with the same sort of urging in your gut that you really want to do something special and you want to lead other people into that experience and see what you can learn from them. Awesome. We have run out of time and I want to thank all of you uh, for being here with us and especially professors Reynolds and Clary. Thank you very much. And I hope to see all of you very, very soon. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you.